Ingo, what can we look forward to in JASP 2023? Well, the, the rare opportunity to read the Juvenilia mm -hmm. uh, or Jane Austen's teenage writings uh, and a new location. We're going to try to, uh, we're going to be on campus at, the, at UNC Chapel Hill in North Carolina um, rather than a hotel this year, um, which should, um, we're right, you know, steps away from wonderful rare books collections and the old theater and uh, lots of resources. Uh, and those who want to can actually live in a dorm on campus, which could be kind of fun to relive uh, or redo uh, <laughs> college <laughs> life. <laughs> right. And that's a nice option if you're trying to shave cost a little bit as well, because that option's cheaper exactly. than hotels, I noticed. Um, yes. So I was excited about that. <laughs> Excellent. And the campus, the UNC Chapel Hill campus is such a lovely historic campus that I think it deepens the immersive quality of the Jane Austen summer program to, to be around buildings that were built in the 1780s and 90s. Like, that's true. Jane uh, Austen could have visited. Yes, that's right. Um, the room, the the place, the hall we were doing our uh, a game night, kind of a, a juvenilia themed game night in, and and the theatricals was actually uh, built in I think eighteen fourteen, so same time as as Emma and uh, Mansfield Park where Austin was writing. So, uh, and also the uh will be in murphy hall which is the classics building um which is a lovely building and that's we'll have lots of space for our discussion groups this year which sometimes they've been kind of cramped in the in in past years right so no one perching on someone else's bed but actually a proper room <laughs> that'll be great <laughs> good i love that the sort of time travel feel of the weekend will be intensified by all of that yeah. But our focus this year is on the juvenilia, which, as you said, is not read that often. So tell us a little bit more about why the juvenilia is a good topic for the summer program and what readers who are new to the juvenilia can expect to find. Yeah, well, the um, the juvenilia, the, I should say the teenage writings, the juvenilia is such a pretentious word, um, <laughs> the, the, the the teenage writings... Um, are so alive, you know, so Austin did not write them for publication. She wrote them for family performance. So um, I think she was freer uh, in, in writing them um, and uh, to let her, you know, wild sense of humor play about and frolic in, in areas and subjects that she wouldn't uh, have touched in her, in her mature writings or published writings. Um, so the sense of the wild sense of humor and um and raucous laughter of it are are really fun. Um they're also the seeds, very much the seeds of her mature novels, many things to observe there. Um and um the uh and I especially like her to see how her um her uh, experiments in narration uh, matured through the the juvenilia, for example. Um, you know how that she, uh, Eleanor and Marianne and presumably First Impressions as well, the early versions of Sense, Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice, uh, we we are pretty, pretty sure were epistolary. Right, written in letters oh. back and forth, yeah. Exactly. And so when uh, there are some of, some of the um, uh, juvenilia, some of the teenage writings, some of the stories experiment with the limits of the pistolary writing. And I love that in Lady Susan, for example, the last, uh, right at the end, she leaves the letters behind and zoom has zooms out. Um, and she is kind of underscoring the limitations of what mm. writing purely in novels can, can give you. Yeah, that's an excellent observation because we think of Austin as being one of the people who really refined free indirect discourse, that sort of narrator on the character's shoulder. So it's fascinating to see how she got there by a process of trying out other popular narrative strategies from the 18th century. Um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in a similar vein, I love the way that she is just out to parody everybody. Like it's, it almost reminds you of a Saturday Night Live skit or something because she takes a really familiar novelistic trope and turns it on its head and it's just a riot as you say it's it's much less filtered 
than her later stuff. And so the the kind of raw feel of the comedy um, is surprising in a mm-hmm. way. Yeah, and she, um, I mean, I think that it's it's a it's an exercise in myth busting mm. uh, in a way what she does, and and our sort of appropriately enough our reading her teenage writings is another act of myth busting because it um it completely undoes this uh victorian inheritance we have the idea of of her being so prim and proper and um and then her period being so prim and proper and and white and clean and pressed um which you know clearly wasn't at all right right you can tell the writer of these novels has stockings that are constantly falling down or something <laughs> feels very human and disheveled and yeah (laughs) wonderful um and uh I hope people are looking at the blogs that have been going through the juvenilia teenage writings very carefully um because it's also fascinating to see the issues that she's interested in as a young writer that she comes back to as a mature writer are there any that stand out particularly for you topics that she seems to return to oh yeah I mean the um little things like you it can't trust people who exaggerate time and numbers um <laughs> but you know bigger bigger issues is like uh about the relationship between manners and morals for example um the idea that um uh so much pressure was put on on women to have um good manners and that those manners uh so much was at stake uh, culturally and socially based on them and it seemed like the nation as a whole would collapse if female manners collapsed. <laughs> um, and so she parodies both extremes. She parodies both the, the uh, those who are too uh, amenable to all others' opinions and those who are, are wildly um, uh, <laughs> flaunting every kind of um, <laughs> tradition. So that's certainly one of the many, many um, and and her, for me, I mean, I've written a lot about the culture of sensibility. So that the her parodies of sensibility just right. she wrote the first and I think the best parody of of the culture of sensibility in its literature at age fourteen, um, <laughs> before any of the other real parodies were published. Uh, so, how about you? What are some of the themes you've enjoyed watching? Um, I love the way she's skewering the sort of received wisdom, both in terms of narrative, because we see that come back in Northanger Abbey, which was written early in her career, but still it's nice to see it made it past the cutting room floor to stay in the, the novel to that meta awareness of what she's doing as a writer. Yeah. Um, and the, the very 18th century aspect of figuring out virtue as a medium between two extremes and trying to thread that needle of balance um, is something that I wasn't expecting to see play out as running from pole to pole in the juvenilia. And so you can sort of see experimenting with both ends. And then as she matures, she is able to show us more how you balance that in a way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Without ever giving us a fixed medium. Right. It's, It's always in movement. There's exactly. hardly any adjective in Jane Austen that's always good or always positive. <laughs> right, right. Um, the uh, I also and I second that idea about the um, herself as an author that's so striking, as as herself as a novelist because um, one of the things I've been looking at recently is is how um, the other women writers in her time they considered I mean they included in their literature poems and tales and conduct books and, and songs and right. she parodies that a little bit um uh and they were plays or they wrote other other genre entirely but right. she was a, from start to finish a novelist yeah um, she really dedicated her life to that uh fledgling genre and i found that fascinating to see you know like the the beautiful cassandra how it's a a novel in 12 chapters but each <laughs> chapter is what <laughs> like two, one sentences. two sentences yeah um right. so all the trappings yeah that's an excellent point because you're right I mean Francis Burney tried to have plays produced Charlotte Lennox did everything so um, did Marie Edgeworth yeah yeah and I'm reading the biography of the Porter sisters right now and they were yeah. multi-genre wonderful. exactly 
Um, yeah, so that I hadn't really thought about the fact that Austin found the genre that was right for her and really honed it as a mm -hmm. young writer so that we we really see the way she's laying that groundwork. Yeah, so that that call to action that she kind of announces to other novelists in Northanger Abbey has has very deep roots. And yeah. we see those exposed in the in the teenage writings. Yeah. I also think that it it um that the teenage writings um uh, really bring her that you know significant port port of a uh, significant part of her life that she spent in Steventon mm -hmm. um you know the first 25 years of her life to to life for us because um you know she didn't publish anything during that time she tried with her father's help but um but nothing is published but it really brings um alive that family culture of literary criticism and performance the you know, family theatricals and and uh you you can feel these stories being read aloud and the sort of in joke quality that it's true you no know, like i think that the teenage writings are screamingly funny and i know there's a whole additional layer of humor that i'm not getting because i'm not an austin um, yeah wonderful we weren't, we weren't flies on the walls <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> I'd settle for being Hill in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So you mentioned theatricals. Theatricals are also one of the things that we have to look forward to at just 2023. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Adam and Blanche uh, McCune, the, the uh, creators, writers, directors, actors, stars. <laughs> stars of the, uh, the theatrical performances at JASP um, will be there again. And, um, and the, you know, from the very beginning of Jasp, uh, Adam or both Adam and Blanche have put on these theatricals, um, always of a piece of juvenilia. And so this is a kind of a culmination of, of their participation in Jasp. And I look forward to really celebrating them. Yeah, which is wonderful. And then we'll also have a screening of Love and Friendship. Yes, the Whit Stillman adaptation of Lady Susan. Exactly. So we usually have a film panel, but there weren't many. There are not many. That's the only film, really, of the <laughs> of the juvenilia. So um, and it's a it's a lot of fun. So it'll be exciting to have Whit Stillman come and answer questions for us about that. That's amazing. Will he be physically there? We don't know yet. Oh, okay. uh, he says it depends on his uh, production work at the time. But exciting that we get his time in real mm -hmm. time as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And there is still an adaptation panel, but we'll be talking to some YA authors, Sayatane Dasgupta and uh, Maria Grace, who both have YA novels that are updates of Jane Austen. And I love that we're taking adaptation broadly enough so that it's both adaptation of the juvenilia or adaptation for a juvenile audience. Um, but it goes I think from... that was a brilliant idea. That was, I think, that might have been your idea, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I still like it. <laughs> we're also practicing what we're preaching in that we are having um, uh, an essay contest, primarily for teenagers, but really for any age. Um, and uh, so we we're going to be celebrating juvenile writing. Oh, there's that word again. We're going to cel celebrating youthful or, or teenage writing in a variety of ways. It's also as you know, the um, a joint um, yes. convention or joint um, uh, celebration of the juvenilia because the International Society of Literary Juvenilia planned their uh, conference, annual conference, or actually it's a biennial conference to uh, coincide with ours. So there's an overlap between those two programs and we'll have a lot of those fantastic specialists in juvenilia um, come to our uh, teenage writing event. That'll be wonderful. So registrants for Jane Austen summer program almost get a BOGO out of it because we have overlapping panels that they can attend the first day. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Another conference for the price of one, which is great. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if someone is coming for the very first time, um, what should they be prepared for or what advice would you have for them? Um. I, I mean, one is just is that we actually do read the the works and talk about them. So bring your copy and um, you don't need to feel intimidated in any way at all. But but it is um, you'll get more out of it if you have your own copy of the readings uh, that you can take to the discussion groups. And uh, but pre be prepared to have fun to both 
talk about the book seriously, but also have fun. Uh, I think that's the beauty of jazz, where one of the main beauties anyway is that we um, uh, don't sacrifice the intellectual for the social, but we also don't sacrifice the social and the crafty and the uh, celebratory for the intellectual. Right, or the embrace of cosplay with dressing up for the Regency Ball on Saturday. You bet. It's non-judgmental dressing up, which is really nice. <laughs> yeah. And I love seeing the range because there will be people there who have hand-stitched their own period-appropriate ball gown. And then there will be fakers like me who ordered a long dress off Amazon and are hoping no one looks too closely. So it's such a welcoming community, both for people yeah, who are just yeah. getting into Austin or people who have Austin-inspired versus memorized by now. Exactly. I, I do think it's a it's a really wonderful community. Um, very rare, I think, community in the way in which it successfully blends town and gown. Yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of mutual respect. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I was going to say the way it's structured so that we have plenary sessions with some of our esteemed experts on Jane Austen's teenage writing. And then we have context corners that give us more detailed focused bits of information. And then we break out into the discussion groups where we get to put all of that information that we've taken in into conversation with each other and with the text and really dive in. And the ideas that we had during the talks, we can then bounce off of people to see if they make sense. I think that is a wonderful structure for really fostering a shared interpretive community which mm. is one of the great pleasures of jasp yeah and also just, and just bringing the bringing the works alive uh, to to life i think that the um um nothing uh, it, we we kind of embody them as well when we're we have a, a sewing workshop and writing and um the theatricals and the game playing i think it it will um uh, it's a full body experience of the Regency, not quite Austin land, but. Uh, <laughs> right. But back to that idea of being really immersive. Yeah. Which I think is a powerful educational tool for us all to get to experience as well. Yeah, I think so. I think so too. It's And it's been a lot of fun these 10, 12 years or so we've had it. Yeah. It's amazing. Excellent. Um, then I hope everybody rushes to the register here button to sh save their spot. We do still have spaces available, but they are finite. So hopefully people will sign up and come join the fun.